It was November 22, 1963. I had only been in Los Angeles a matter of months and studying broadcasting at Los Angeles City College. When the news came over the loudspeakers on campus that the president had been shot, my fellow classmates and I gathered in front of a black and white television, like all of America and most of the world. Within moments, a grainy photograph was displayed of a possible suspect in the shooting of a police officer in Dallas named J.D. Tippett. The individual fled to a local movie theater where he was quickly apprehended and identified as Lee Harvey Oswald. A fellow student standing behind me said, That's Lee! I turned around and looked at him. Lee? I inquired. Yeah, Lee Oswald. I remember him. We served in the Marine Corps together. I asked Roland if he would uh, mind stepping into another room with me so we might have a brief conversation on tape. Later, that interview would air almost everywhere. It may have been the first eyewitness personal account of the man who would later be charged but never tried as the assassin of JFK. It was my first so-called media scoop, although I dislike the term and regret that my broadcasting career would begin on such a solemn note. But it did. I was 18 years old. Approximately three and a half hours ago, a suspect who allegedly shot the president and killed him, Mr. Lee Harvey Oswald, was picked up and arrested in Dallas, Texas. Roland Bynum claims to have known the suspect, Lee Harvey Oswald. Mr. Bynum, where did you know him? Well, when I was stationed in the Marine Corps three years ago, uh, he was in the same squadron that I was in, Max Knight. Did you see uh, Mr. Oswald's picture on the television? Yes, I did. Uh, and you're quite sure this is the man? I'm positive that that's the same man that was stationed with me uh, when I was in the Marine Corps. I'm positive. What kind of a guy was he? Well, from what I can recollect of uh, Oswald, he was he was sort of a different type of individual from, from the average person, I would say. He used to more or less hang around by himself, and he had funny ideas about different topics and whatnot. Do you know why he went to Russia? Well, I remember that he went to Russia as a tourist, but I couldn't understand how could he get to Russia as, on, as a tourist basis because he got out of the short service on a hardship discharge. I remember this. Meaning what? Well, I understand that the Red Cross notified him and said that his, his parents, his mother, if I can recollect, was having difficulties and it would be best for him to uh, be released from the service on the hardship discharge. I don't see possible, I don't see how he could possibly do it if he got on the hardship discharge. I understand that uh, Mr. Oswald is supposed to be very intellectual. I don't know if this is true or not. Well, do you ever talk politics with him? Well, it's so hard to see if, to, to see if I, remember if I did or not because I remember him when I first went in the Marine Corps and I remember him for about a year, and uh, I can't really recall talking politics with him, but I have talked with him, but I just can't remember exactly what it was. Uh, with your conversations with uh, this man, did he ever voice any beliefs or opinions about the country or the president? Well, your recollection? Uh, not, to my, not to my recollection, from, my, from what I heard uh, from him personally, but... The, the fellows that lived in the same belt with him, quite often they would say that he had funny views about things. This has been Elliot Mintz chatting with Roland Bynum about Lee Harvey Oswald, alleged slayer of the President of the United States. Now, I'm curious to know just how you supported yourself during the three years that you lived in the Soviet Union. Did you have a government subsidy? Uh, well, as I, uh, uh, well, I will answer that question. Uh, that uh, question directly then, uh, since uh, uh, you will not rest until you get your answer. 
uh, I worked in Russia. Uh, I was under uh, the protection of the uh, of the. Uh, I was, that is to say, I was not under the protection of the uh, American government, but that is, I was uh, at all times uh, considered an American citizen. Uh, I was under uh, the protection of the uh, of the. Uh, I was, that is to say, I was not under the protection of the uh, American government, but that is, I was uh, at all times uh, considered an American citizen. I did not uh, lose my. Uh, American citizenship. Did you say you wanted to at one point, though, or what happened? Well, it's a, a long, drawn-out uh, situation in which permission to live in the Soviet Union granted to a foreign resident is very rarely given. Uh, this this requires <coughs> a certain amount of technicalities, uh, uh, technical papers, and so forth. Uh, at no time, as I say, was I uh, did I renounce my citizenship or attempt to renounce my citizenship, and at no time was I out of contact or uh, with the uh, American Embassy. I'm Pardon back. Me. Uh, Excuse me. May I interrupt just one second? Uh, either one of these two statements is wrong. The Washington Evening Star of October 31st, 1959, page 1, reported that Lee Harvey Oswald, a former Marine of 4936 Collingwood Street, Fort Worth, Texas, had turned in his passport at the American Embassy in Moscow on that same date and had said that he had applied for Soviet citizenship. Now, this seems to me that you've renounced your American citizenship if you've turned in your passport. Well, the very obvious answer to that is that I'm back in the United States. A person who renounces his citizenship, citizenship becomes legally uh, disqualified for returning to the United States. In 1963, in summer 63, in New Orleans, when this communist defector sought a passport, he got one in 24 hours. Now, the other individuals who applied on that day did not get it in 24 hours. But Oswald got his, a passport to go to Europe, Spain, many other places, in 24 hours. And I, as most of you know, this is not possible, not to even get a passport, if you are truly a defector. Right, and Soviet authorities, this is from the Washington Post and Times Herald of November 16, 1959, Soviet authorities had refused to grant it, although they had informed him that he could live in Russia as a resident alien. What did you do during the two weeks from October 31st to November 16th, 1959? As I've already stated, of course, this uh, whole conversation, and we don't have too much time left, is getting away from the Cuban-American problem. Uh, however, I'm quite willing to discuss myself for the remainder of this uh, program. Uh, as I've sta stated, it is very difficult for a resident, uh, for a foreigner, to, to get permission to reside in the Soviet Union. Uh, during those two weeks and during the date that you mentioned, I was, of course, uh, uh, with the knowledge of the American Embassy, getting this permission. Were you having a building at 11 Kuznetskaya Street in Moscow? Kuznetskaya? PRT 21. Practical Russian Test 21. United States Army Examination. He was taught Russian by the United States government. The city of Dallas, Texas, was just one of many American cities to which John F. Kennedy, as president, had traveled. Dallas is a business and commercial center in the Southwest, a city with frontier traditions and oil millionaires. Close to Dallas is a neighboring city, Fort Worth. For years, there has been a rivalry with Dallas, expressed in everything from football gridirons to jet airports. It was to a fateful rendezvous that John F. Kennedy came in the 11th month of the year 1963 when he chose to visit Fort Worth and Dallas. Did those things which make it possible for not only Texas but the entire United States to prosper and grow as we do in the 1960s. In 1990, the age of space will be entering its second phase and our hopes in it to preserve the peace, to make sure that in this great new sea, as on Earth, the United States is second to none. Let me go back to the way things were about this time, just before the assassination. We had a young president who was showing signs, increasingly, of being a forceful president and a liberal president in the sense that he was going to make changes that had not been made before. 
and a very strong reaction was occurring in a number of places, particularly in areas such as Dallas, Texas. And this is not an indictment of the people of Dallas. But there are individuals in Dallas that have an unusually strong control over key individuals on the police force, which causes Dallas to be somewhat different than other cities. President Kennedy was also moving in the direction of doing away with a 27.5% deduction on the income tax for men in the oil business, which of course was, primary, was a primary concern to some individuals in Dallas. President Kennedy had reached a rapprochement of sorts with Premier Khrushchev of Russia and was in the process of reaching an understanding with Fidel Castro. Now, the reaction of a number of individuals, especially in certain areas of Texas, was that President Kennedy, in ending the Cuban adventures, in trying to reach an understanding with Khrushchev, caused him to be regarded by a number of extreme individuals as a communist or a person selling out to the communists. So that there was a, there was a certain side of the spectrum of uh, essentially the extreme right-wing area, especially in southern states, that had a venomous attitude towards John Kennedy. Now this is just a brief, perhaps oversimplified summary of the situation as it existed when John Kennedy visited Dallas. Now with that background, let's now jump from reality into the world of illusion for a moment and we'll describe the official Lyndon Johnson administration version of what happened. The official story is that every possible safeguard had been taken to protect the president. And he was proceeding down Elm Street, having made the turn from Houston, when from his lair in the sixth floor of the school book depository, a Marxist communist was crouched with his man like a cannon. He fires three rapid shots, shots of fantastic marksmanship. And as a result, the president, of course, is killed and the governor of Texas is wounded. And as I know Mark Lane has explained to you at some length, the this is such an unusual rifle, and the ammunition is so unusual that one bullet created seven different wounds and emerged in pristine shape. Uh, as a matter of fact, there was a delay of approximately a second and a half between the time that the bullet finished going through President Kennedy and began its journey through the governor. But no matter. The, the president's seal was on the outside, and that was good enough for Newsweek. Anyway, this is the official version. In reality, what happened was this. An elaborate conspiracy had been worked on for a very long time. There were three levels. Uh, of course, classification, as I know you well know, is an arbitrary thing, but for for reasons of convenience, we classify, uh, we, we call it operating level, individuals pulling triggers, operating the radios, driving the cars, intermediate level, individuals pr providing services such as uh, uh, David Ferry, Jack Ruby, and others, and then the sponsor level, uh, which I uh, can't go into in too much detail. That gets kind of high up. Uh, but those are the three general levels. Anyway, by the time the president made his turn, the men who were to kill him were set to go. There had to be no less than four basic points from which the shooting occurred. That's why you can't see the autopsy pictures. That's why no one can see them. That's why a pathologist selected by this community cannot look at them. 
because the autopsy pictures will show that President Kennedy was hit from a number of different directions. The autopsy pictures will show that he was hit in the front of the head at least twice. It will show that there's a hole in the President's forehead at the temple line, and it will show that the right side of his head has been torn off by a bullet coming from the right, and God knows how many other wounds, but at least two from the front. And you aren't supposed to see that because you are supposed to be dutiful Americans and believe the fairy tale of the lone assassin because that's what the president wants you to believe. Police in Dallas tonight wove tighter the web of evidence around Lee Harvey Oswald, accused slayer of President Kennedy. No examination was made of the Manlicka Carcano, which Oswald supposedly fired, but never did. No examination was made to determine whether it was fired. They couldn't make an examination of it because of the possibility it may not have been fired. And the reason this position was taken was because of their awareness that he was not involved in the shooting. Oswald's prints, his fingerprints, were not on the rifle, although the inference was given that they were. Oswald's fingerprints were not on the Smith & Wesson 38, the kill tippet although the inference has been created that they were. Police said they have in their possession photos showing Oswald holding the rifle that killed the president. They said the FBI reported Oswald bought the rifle from a Chicago mail order house and the handwriting on the order matched Oswald's. The pictures were found in a room of Oswald's apartment in Irving, Texas, outside Dallas. Photos show him with the sidearm strapped on his belt and the rifle in his hand. In addition, Police Chief Jesse Curry said the FBI reports Oswald purchased the Italian-made 6.5 Carcano bolt-action rifle with a telescopic sight. The German Army 765 Mauser had been turned over to the FBI from a Chicago mail-order house for $12.78. Police Chief Jesse Curry stumbled through a makeshift press conference in the crowded third floor hallway of the Dallas jailhouse. Do you think the smudged fingerprints that have been found on the rifle which killed the president will be able to establish the identity of the killer? We hope so, but I couldn't say possibly this time that they will be. Oswald, who once defected behind the Iron Curtain, denies he had anything to do with the president's assassination. He has refused to take a lie detector test. Remember, supposedly, Oswald, who did not kill Tippett, supposedly he ran, unloading bullets, as he, uh, cartridges as he ran, and putting in new bullets. Then in the Texas theater, he stood up and yelled, this is it, and supposedly there was a big struggle, and he tried to shoot an officer, and they got the gun from him. Well, when that gun was examined, there was not a fingerprint on it. It had been wiped clean. And the reason it has been wiped clean is Oswald never held it in his hands. Another gratuitous contribution to the, uh, to the scenario over the Dallas police force. And you haven't been told, unless you've made a hobby, or some people have, of looking deeply into it, that the nitrate test indicated that Lee Oswald had not fired a rifle that day. There's no question about this. This became so clear that the Warren Commission was forced to take this standard test, which is accepted all over the world, and try to develop a new position that uh, there was a question about it. Paraffin tests show he fired a weapon shortly before he was captured yesterday. Gunpowder traces appear on both hands, which would indicate he fired a rifle, the type of weapon which killed the president. Oswald has demanded that John Apt, a New York City lawyer associated with communist causes, defend him. His case is expected to go before a grand jury either next Wednesday or the following Monday. A Dallas County District Attorney, Henry Wade, expects Oswald's trial to begin in January. Wade says he will prosecute Oswald himself. The penalty, if Oswald is convicted, is death.
I think he suspected him because of a description that had been put out on the radio. On the police radio. Chief Curry, when you first uh, knew of the Dallas policeman said, uh, what then led you to the theater? What information did you have from there? I understand that someone called, uh, I think the ticket taker from the theater called. Chief, do you have... We did not have... You were not informed. We had not been informed of this man. Chief, do you have any concern for the safety of your prisoner in view of the high feeling among the people of Dallas over the assassination of the president? No, but precautions necessary, precautions will be taken, of course, but I'm not, uh, I don't think that, uh, that the people will try to take the prisoner away from us. One call. Now the prisoner uh, wearing a black sweater, he has changed from his t-shirt, is being uh, moved out toward an armored car, being let out by uh, Captain Fritz. There is the prisoner. Do you have anything to say in your defense? What? There's a shot. Oswald has been shot. Oswald has been shot. Penn Jones, Jr., editor of the Middle Othian Press in Texas and author of Forgive My Grief, Volumes 1 and 2. Mm -hmm. He was working on a book on the assassination uh, with uh, two reporters of the Fort Worth Star Telegram, mm -hmm. Thayer Waldo and uh, Ed Johnson. Thayer Waldo uh, found it convenient to find employment uh, outside the United States. Ed Johnson went to work for uh, Les Leslie Carpenter in Washington, D.C., who is the husband of Elizabeth Carpenter, who is the secretary to Mrs. Lyndon Johnson. And uh, uh, Jim Cody was killed by a karate chop to the throat in his apartment in Dallas, Texas. His killer was not uh, indicted uh, for, the, uh, for that murder. And the murder uh, stands unsolved. When did that murder take place? In about September of 1964. Bill Hunter was killed in the public safety building in in Long Beach, California. Please tell us Bill Hunter's background. How Bill Hunter is a native of Dallas. He and Cody worked together in their uh, early days as newspaper men on the Wichita Falls paper. Mm -hmm. uh, Cody is a West Texas boy, and uh, Hunter is a native of Dallas. Then uh, Hunter eventually got a job here in Long Beach. He was in Dallas visiting his parents and covering the visit of the president for his paper here in Long Beach when the assassination took place. He stayed to cover the assassination. Uh, and I, the thing I think that got him in trouble is that both Hunter and Cody attended a rather strange meeting uh, in Ruby's apartment on Sunday night after Ruby had killed Oswald. Present in this apartment was uh, George Senator, Ruby's uh, roommate, and uh, Tom Howard, Bill Hunter, and uh, Jim Cody. A meeting in Ruby's apartment? Yes, and three out of these four people are now dead. There, there were two other people present, but uh, uh, neither of them were, n were called to testify before the Warren Commission. One of them said he did not hear what went on in the apartment that night. He said, I didn't want to hear. Uh, his name is uh, C.A. Droby, and uh, he had already been threatened, uh, his, his family had been threatened, so he withdrew as, uh, as uh, Oswald's first lawyer after the assassination. Well, there were four good male witnesses to the escaping Tippett killer. You see, I do not believe that uh, Oswald killed anyone, mm -hmm. and uh, certainly uh, he didn't shoot a gun that day. Mm -hmm. So when, when uh, the police accuse Oswald of killing Tippett, then we need to go to the witnesses who saw the escaping Tippett killer. Mm -hmm. We'll take four male witnesses. One of them was uh, Warren Reynolds. Mm -hmm. uh, shortly after the assassination, uh, Reynolds was shot through the head. He did not die, but uh, he, he, he was so sure it was not Oswald that he was not even asked by the police to go down and view Oswald in the police lineup. Uh, after uh, Reynolds got out of the hospital, he, he uh, decided that it was Oswald that he saw escaping, mm -hmm. and it uh, may have been a wise decision. Uh, another one, 
was uh, Domingo Benavides. Benavides was only 25 feet from Tippett when uh, Tippett fell. Uh, Domingo didn't think it was uh, Oswald. In fact, when he was testifying before uh, Attorney Bellin of the Warren Commission, David W. Bellin, Bellin asked uh, Domingo what uh, the escaping killer looked like, and, Bell and uh, Domingo said he looked like you. Well, Bellin uh, hurriedly put into the record where he was on the day of the assassination. I would much have preferred that he put into the record what Bellin looked like. Hmm. so that we'd have a description of the escaping Tippett killer as far as Domingo was concerned. What happened to Benavides? Well, Domingo's brother was killed in a senseless beer hall fight by what appeared to be a rather uh, just a paid killing. Uh, an ex-convict spent 18 months in the penitentiary for killing uh, Domingo's brother, Edward Benavides. Now, both Domingo and his father-in-law thought that uh, it was just a case of mistaken identity. Hmm. This hired killer simply got the wrong Mexican. Now, the other fellow was named Harold Russell. Mm -hmm. Harold Russell didn't think it was Oswald. He was working for the Reynolds Motor Company that day. He and Warren Reynolds rushed out together, and both of them saw the escaping killer. Warren uh, uh, Russell uh, then quit this uh, firm and went back to his uh, home in Davis, Oklahoma, when one afternoon when he went out on a date, uh, went out to a party with a, a lady, uh, he went out of his mind and started having, I don't know what was wrong with him. Uh, he was crying that uh, people were trying to kill him, and he wanted his friends there at the party to hide him. Well, the friends called a policeman, and the policeman came out and knocked uh, Harold in the head and uh, killed him. Well, I think one of the most important ones is, is the death of Rose Sharmy. Penn Jones. Rose Sharmy was a prostitute for Jack Ruby. Uh, in Dallas when, uh, and also she was on dope. When you say she was a prostitute for Jack Ruby, do you mean that she, she was one of the strippers out of the club who uh, worked on the side? Well, if you want to be kind, uh, that, yes, if you want to be generous, but uh, there are too many witnesses in the 26 volumes who say this was a whorehouse. And uh, I don't know perhaps all that, of them. Perhaps that might have been one of Mr. Ruby's sidelines, but, but the place was predominant. The, the, uh, the strip joint was a sideline. The whorehouse and dope was the main business. Out of the carousel club? Yes. Now, now Rose Charmy hmm. was in a car with two men going to Florida for a load of narcotics for Ruby on November the 20th, 1963. I don't know what happened, but uh, apparently the two men became unhappy with Rose. They threw her out of a moving automobile. And when the police picked her up, they said it was obvious what had happened. She'd been thrown out of a moving automobile, but she was having withdrawal pains and was screaming that President Kennedy would be killed when he got to Dallas. Now, the police took her to doctors, and the doctors listened to her a little bit and threw her in a mental hospital. And, uh, this occurred November 20th. November 20th, 1963, in Louisiana. She was thrown out of the car near Eunice, Louisiana. A few days after the assassination, the doctors who had put uh, Rose uh, in the mental ward uh, happened to remember her, and they called. Senator had her back, brought back to their offices, and uh, she had dried out and was uh, normal. And uh, uh, they were reading her some of these... Uh, stories about the assassination and they read to her where uh, Ruby had denied knowing Oswald and uh, Rose laughed and said they were bedmates what are you talking about of course she was killed a, a few months after that how well I don't know why she was walking down a, a highway at 2 a.m. in the morning but uh, she was hit by a car and uh, it was a hit and run an unsolved hit and run and she was quite dead when they got her to the hospital. Uh, Betty McDonald was a, a stripper for uh, Ruby at one time, uh, and uh, uh, when Reynolds was shot through the head, a man named Garner was arrested. Betty McDonald said it couldn't have been Garner. He was in bed with me at the time. Uh, so the police uh, released Garner. A week after this, Betty was arrested for fighting with uh, another girlfriend on the street. The police acted as judge. They only arrested Betty. They did not arrest the other participant in the fight. 
and an hour after she was placed in jail, she was found hanging in her cell. She's 23 years of age. Rose Sheremy was 40. Delilah Wall was 27. Delilah was uh, a stripper for uh, Jack Ruby. Uh, she left uh, uh, Dallas shortly after the assassination and was uh, plying her trade in uh, Omaha, Nebraska when a fellow from New Orleans came up and married to Delilah and 24 days later he shot her uh, dead. Uh, of course, when the police got there, they said he was drunk. However, this fellow uh, hit her uh, seven times out of eight with a pistol. Uh, he wasn't really too drunk when he started shooting. Dorothy Kilgallen is on my uh, list of strange deaths. And I place her there because I only know of four people who had the opportunity to talk to, talk to Ruby or Oswald mm -hmm. alone mm -hmm. after they committed their part in this crime. Those four people are Tom Howard. We've already talked about right. the lawyer who died of a strange heart attack in Dallas. In fact, mm -hmm. we don't know it was a heart attack. It was a parent heart attack. Uh, another one is Earlene Roberts, who was the... She swept the floors and made up the beds out at uh, Oswald's rooming house. Mm -hmm. Another one is William Whaley, the man who says he carried Oswald from the Greyhound Station out to some point on South Beckley. Mm -hmm. And the other one is Dorothy Kilgallen. Now, these are the only four people that I know who had a chance to talk to either of these two men alone in a room that wasn't bugged after these men committed their crime. Uh, and for that reason, I class all of them in, in the strange death. When did Dorothy Kilgallen talk with Ruby? Dorothy Kilgallen came down to Dallas during the Ruby trial and stayed for a couple of days. To cover for the Hearst Papers? Yes. Right. During one of the noon recesses, she spent an hour and a half in Judge Joe B. Brown's chambers, just she and the judge. Uh, after an hour and a half, the judge came out and sent Ruby into his chambers. So he even kept the bodyguards outside the room, the judge's chambers. Uh, she and uh, Ruby were in that room alone for 30 minutes. Now, I don't know what was said. I don't know if anything was said. But I do know that uh, just a few days before her death, Dorothy Kilgallen told a TV makeup man in New York City that in five more days, she said, in five more days, I'm going to New Orleans and break this case wide open. Hmm. Now, I remind you, that was a long time before either you or I, either one, knew anything about Jim Garrison. And... Uh, for that reason, I include her on my list. Now, I know she told it, them that because when I was in New York being made up for a show, he told me that she told him this. For that reason, I include her. Uh, Gary Underhill was a CIA agent who uh, immediately after the assassination uh, left uh, Washington and went to New York and, and begged his friends to hide him. He said flatly that he knew who killed President Kennedy and he knew they were going to kill him. Well, he stayed hid up there for uh, several weeks, and finally, I suppose, decided that he was paranoid or he was imagining mm -hmm. things. So he went back to his home in Washington, and a few months thereafter, he committed, they said, he committed suicide. Of course, he was right-handed, but when he committed suicide, he shot himself uh, through the left temple and out on the other side. I suppose, though, when you're shooting, when you're committing suicide, it doesn't matter which hand you use. Former CIA agent. Yes. Mm -hmm. And and Underhill said flatly that uh, the CIA was involved in the assassination and that they were unhappy with President Kennedy over the far eastern wing of the CIA was unhappy with President uh, Kennedy. J. Lee Rankin, counsel for the Warren Commission, came in, boy lawyer, and said, you know, I just met with uh, two of the highest officials, of the prosecutors in Texas, the Attorney General Wagner Carr and the District Attorney Henry Wade. Mark Lane, author of Rush to Judgment and Assassination Investigator. And they both told me that Oswald was an employee of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and they knew the secret number which had been assigned to him, they knew what his salary was, etc. They knew that he was on the payroll when he died in the basement of the Dallas Police Station. They were right that Oswald was an employee of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Garrison believes, as do I, that Oswald was an employee of the FBI. He was working for the FBI during this whole period. 
that his presence at the meetings was as a spy for the Federal Bureau of Investigation. He was present there as a representative of the FBI, and he was reporting back. And there is evidence to indicate that he did report back on November 17, 1963, five days in advance of the assassination, and he told them what the plan was. He told the Federal Bureau of Investigation that the plan was to kill the president in five days. On the, the evening of November 17th, the Washington office of the FBI sent out a communique, telex message to every southern regional office of the FBI. I know this from William S. Walter, who was a security clerk at the FBI in New Orleans, and uh, I spoke in, at Tulane University, and uh, Mr. Walter was in the back of the auditorium, and uh, during the question period, he walked up to my wife and said, uh, I have uh, information. I'm, I don't want anyone to know. I'm a student here at the law mm -hmm. school here, and I don't want anyone to know about it, but uh, I'll tell it to you, and I'll call your husband later tonight. And the information he gave her was that he was a security, a security clerk. He received a telex message, and it said, from Washington, Washington office of the FBI, and it said, an attempt would be made to kill President Kennedy in Dallas on November 22, 1963. There remains no answer. The evidence of the doctors at the Parkland Memorial Hospital that the wound in the president's throat was an entrance wound stands to this day, and there's no answer to that question. The evidence that shots came from at least two different directions, that at least five shots were fired in 5.6 seconds, and the alleged weapon, the man the Carcano, required a minimum of 2.3 seconds, according to the FBI, the fastest rifleman they could find. Uh, the weapon required 2.3 seconds as an interval period just to work the bolt and prepare to fire the next shot would indicate that five shots could not possibly be fired with the alleged assassination weapon. I'm an old-fashioned lawyer, and I think that one should not offer a conclusion until it is presented to a jury. Mm -hmm. There's the other side presented, and the jury renders its verdict. Uh, but I believe, based upon the evidence which Garrison has secured, which he has been kind enough to show to me, that that is the only conclusion that one can reach. Did anybody uh, assist them, or was it an independent venture? Well, uh, CIA doesn't really need very much help. Uh, they initiate programs on their own. <coughs> they carry them out, and it appears that they utilize the anti-Castro uh, Cuban exiles mm -hmm. for their program, but it was a CIA program. Jim Garrison know the names of the individual Central Intelligence Agency members who planned the assassination? Yes, he does. And uh, Does he know when and where it, the idea was hatched? Yes. Well, I don't know. If he, I don't think he, he knows precisely where it began within the CIA. He knows when meetings took place and what decisions were made and what discussions took place and who was involved. Uh, what he cannot do thus far is to completely penetrate the operations of the CIA to find out how high in the organization it was that this uh, plan of, uh, initi was initiated. But uh, I'm not even sure he will ever be able to dis discover that. But he does know of, of specific meetings where men sat around a table and, uh, and planned how they were going to kill the president. Yes. Why... Um why did they want to do it? Why did the CIA want to kill the president? Well, that really calls for some speculation, but I think that the evidence indicates uh, what the conversations were among those who were talking about the assassination of President Kennedy before it took place. And there were, I guess, three basic areas which came up con uh, continually. One was after the Bay of Pigs. Uh, president Kennedy had made it very plain that he was disenchanted, to use the term, uh, uh, which is a mild one, I think, with the role of the Central Intelligence Agency mm -hmm. in planning the Bay of Pigs invasion. Of course, Kennedy had said that he had never in his life relied upon experts in the past. He always relied upon his instincts. But in terms of planning the Bay of Pigs invasion, he said for the first time he relied upon experts. There were those meetings which took place when Arthur Schlesinger now states that he was the... Uh, the, the lone dissenter at the meetings, and he said, no, I mean, the, you, you cannot have an invasion and depend upon the Cubans to rise up against Castro. And the CIA representative would say, do you have any contacts in Cuba at the present time? And Schlesinger would say, no, but it's just my belief. Do you speak Spanish, Mr. Schlesinger? 
He would say, no, I don't even speak Spanish. And so the experts came forward and said, we have operatives there. And uh, the Cuban people will rise up against Castro. All we need is a, a small invasion on the beaches, and that will give them the excuse. Mm -hmm. And Kennedy relied upon the experts. And uh, evidently, uh, as it has developed, well, we know what happened. Castro passed out guns to the people. That was the election that the uh, American people keep on saying has never taken place in Cuba. That was the election. They gave the guns to the people, and they rushed to the beaches and, and re repulsed the invasion. And uh, it was the hope of the CIA that once the uh, invasion began, although they, they themselves knew there would be no revolution in Cuba, that once Kennedy was committed to that, there would be air power, and there would be... Uh, bombing of Havana and other cities. But uh, Kennedy did not fall into the trap when the invasion failed. He said, well, then it has failed. It has failed, period. We mm -hmm. will do nothing more. And that was the end of it. And with that, he incurred the wrath of the Central Intelligence Agency and of the Cuban exiles in, in the United States. I see. That was the first thing. Later, Kennedy said, and Schlesinger reported, and I think in the current book, Evelyn Lincoln, his secretary, reported as well, Andrew Pearson has reported, that I would like to take the CIA, he said, and destroy it, turn it into splinters and scatter the pieces to the winds. That was during uh, September and October of 1963, but since he was killed in November, he was never, never able to carry out that program. That was one thing. Uh, and the, the detente that uh, Kennedy was working out with Cuba was the second thing, the fact that he realized that uh, at that point that Castro was there and he could not be removed by American action short of violence and that Kennedy was not committed to violence against Cuba. And that was the second problem for the CIA. And the third, I think, and perhaps the most important one of, of all, was Kennedy's position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Vietnam. In September of 63, 1,000 American soldiers were not sent there, but w were withdrawn from Vietnam. And in November of 63, the month he was killed, another 1,000 soldiers were withdrawn from Vietnam last act of the Kennedy administration vis-a-vis -vis Vietnam. And we were down to 15,500 soldiers when his head was torn off in uh, Dealey Plaza. I think Garrison sums it up very well. He says, that if there's any meaning of November 22nd in Dealey Plaza, it is that any president who wishes to dismantle the war machine will have his head blown off in the streets of America. Is it too late? I hope not. Uh, I'd just like to say a word to those liberals who say he wasn't such a good president anyway. I think that's not relevant. I think he was a pretty good president. Castro, for those who respect his position, said just before the assassination, he thought that Kennedy had reached the point in his life where he could very well be the greatest president in the history of the United States. And mm -hmm. I think that that might have been a sound assessment. But it was not for one one might say that President Kennedy turned toward peace very slowly. Mm -hmm. I think that's a valid assessment of his role. But I think one should remember that it was not for the slowness of his turn that he was killed, but for the fact that he turned it all mm -hmm. that he was killed. And I think that his assassination was a lesson to all, that who, f all who follow. And that is that uh, a turn in that direction toward the dismantling of that which has uh, afflicted the lives of people throughout th this whole globe uh, is going to be punished by death. That's the penalty which the federal government has written in for those who dare to uh, occupy a position of power and use that on behalf of the people of the world. And uh, that's where we are at the present time. Is it too late? I don't know. Someone asked me that today at a bookstore and uh, it was a, a very pretty young girl and I didn't want to disappoint her. I didn't know what to say. All I could say was, uh, we have to keep trying, and I think that's where it is. I don't think anybody really knows if it's too late. Maybe it is too late. Maybe it, maybe it is not too late, but I think we have an absolute responsibility, and that is to make every single effort that we can to make this country be the kind of country that we used to think that it was, which it probably never has been anyway, but which uh, there's a cancer in this country in terms of the the attitude of the vast majority of the people toward the black people of this country, and this is a cancer which afflicts us, and uh, those Earl Robinson songs uh, mm -hmm. about uh, the great America, 
never really had any application in terms of what this country really was. But if we want to use those as a model for what we might be someday, that, that would be fine. That would be a good idea. And can it ever be that? I don't know if it can ever be that. I don't know if it's too late. I just know what our responsibility is. My guest is Mark Lane. And while we were over there, I heard a shrill whistle, which drew my attention back to the north side of Elm Street. Roger Craig, former Dallas police officer. And I saw a man running down the grassy knoll, and a light green, nice Rambler station wagon driving slowly west on Elm Street. The driver was looking up toward the man running down. Mm -hmm. When they got parallel, the car stopped, the man got in, and they drove west on Elm Street. Could you identify the man running down that hill? I did identify him in Captain Fritz's office that evening. Now, yes. when you presented this information to Captain Fritz, what was his reply? How did he react to your he, statement? He thanked me, and I left. Did he say anything? How long did that conversation last? Well, <coughs> excuse me. We, uh, I entered uh, the outer part of his office, the reception part. Agent Bookout with the FBI was taking the names of the people coming into the outer office. Mm -hmm. All the stenographers were dismissed and, and replaced by FBI agents or Captain Fritz's own people. Mm -hmm. Captain Fritz pointed through the window at a man sitting behind a desk. There were actually two men in the room, one on the right, one on the left. He asked me if I could recognize any of the men. Mm -hmm. I picked Lee Harvey Oswald as the man running down the grassy knoll. We then entered Captain Fritz's office. Fritz said to Mr. Oswald, he said, this man saw you leave, in which time Oswald replied, I told you people I did. Go ahead. Now, attempting to calm Oswald down as he was a little excited then, he said, now take it easy, son, we're just trying to find out what happened. Now, the next question posed to Lee Harvey Oswald was, what about the car? Mm -hmm. C-A-R. Mm -hmm. At which time Oswald leaned forward, put both hands on the desk, and in a very excited voice said that station wagon belongs to Mrs. Payne. Don't try to drag her into this. Then he settled back and with a very disgusted look on his face remarked, Everybody will know who I am now. Maggie Field, assassination investigator. Here's the testimony of Rufus Youngblood, who was the Secret Service agent attached to the then Vice President Johnson. He says, he looked at the building. I didn't see anything. I didn't notice anything in this particular window. I saw nothing unusual. This is a description of his having scanned the book depository. Here's Emery Roberts, assistant to the secret, uh, assistant secret service agent in charge. He says, I could not determine from what direction the shots came, but felt they had come from the right side. Here is a report of Secret Service agent John Reddy, who was in the follow-up car behind the president, immediately behind him. And he says, I heard what sounded like firecrackers going off from my post on the right front running board. Here's Secret Service agent Hickey, who says, I heard a loud report come from the right rear, but it seemed to me to be at ground level. Secret Sur Service agent Forrest Sorrells, who was really the chief down there, said, I looked towards the top of the terrace uh, to, my f to the front as the sound of the shot seemed to me to be coming from that direction. Now these are all Secret Service agents talking. These are not hysterical witnesses. At Santa Ana, Oswald was one of five men in an organization where every man had a minimum confidential security clearance to have this crypto clearance I told you about. He knew all of the radar codes for the West Coast. All of the radar, radar codes, codes mm -hmm. of the Marine. You know, they worried about atom bombs. Mm -hmm. uh, now, this is not beads. This is codes. Right. Uh, he knew the frequencies. He knew the identification methods. He knew the height, how high the radar could go. That was quite a military secret. Uh, he knew its range. He knew the, the means used to uh, make the installation secure, and I didn't. Uh, 
but they had the antennae some distance away, and they had some special electronic gear where they could communicate with the antennae and use them. So if the big bad Chinese or the Russians came over and they were to go on a bomb, they bombed the aerials, and the rest of the installation is intact because the installation is not where the radi aerials are. Don't you think it was kind of the Marine Corps to teach this new kind of communist all of these secrets so that when he, quote, defected, close quote, he would have all of them to take to the Russians? We have no extradition treaties with, we do not recognize the Republic of South Africa. Who were going to uh, be the, the passengers in this airplane that he was to fly? I'm sorry, I will not, I cannot say, because I only know the first name of Oh, oh no, I, I'm not looking for the names, I'm looking for, I mean, are these people who would have pulled triggers in Dealey Plaza, these people who... They were did, both of them. Both of them? You're saying now that, that two men pulled triggers in Dealey Plaza? And these two, uh, these, these two in the plane, yes. And these were the people who David Ferry was contracted to fly from Texas to ultimately South Africa. That's right. He said the plane did not take off from where it was supposed to have taken off. He later told you this. Yes. Did David Ferry tell you that he actually f made that flight? He did not make the flight, sir. He didn't make the flight? No. They never came to where they were to come to. The they went south instead. They went. They went south, uh, directly south or southwestward, instead of going southeasterly to south of Houston, the to where David was waiting. David was waiting in South Houston. So, south of Houston. He was waiting south of Houston. Yes, I, 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 I don't know where, but it, I know it was near Houston, as Ollie said. With the plane, uh -huh. and the two trigger men were supposed to rendezvous with him there. Yes, because their plane was not a strong plane. He had a stronger plane. Where did they go? He had a two engine. They had a one engine. Where did these two trigger men go? David said they crashed on a sandy islet off of Corpus Christi, Texas, and burned. And the federal government, which happens to have a naval air station at Corpus Christi, cleaned up everything. About three hours after the assassination, uh, word came from Washington, D.C., um, it was reported on the radio and television that there was no conspiracy. Uh, I'm, I don't know if you'll recall, but initially, shortly after the assassination, almost immediately after, the word from Dallas was, uh, shortly after they had captured Oswald, that they believed this might be a communist conspiracy. 
Now, within hours after that, word came from Washington, D.C., that there was no conspiracy, that uh, the assassin had been captured, and uh, there was no indication that there was anybody involved other than that one man. Now, it was immediately apparent to me that the federal government was making a statement on the very afternoon of the assassination that it could not know to be true at that time. Mm -hmm. Even giving them the benefit of the doubt, uh, we might say they were making a statement that they hoped to be true, but obviously it would take months of the most intensive kind of investigation to determine whether or not there was a conspiracy. Oswald, of course, said he was innocent. Uh, but even if he said he was guilty, and if he said, I'm guilty, but I did it alone, they obviously could not take his word for it. So that was a, uh, a so you were, sign. You were suspicious about the assassination of the president within hours after uh, uh, the president had been uh, shot. Yes. Yes, that's true. Now, from that point on, you've been doing research, I take it, into the case. And how extensive has the research gone? Well, I've spent a great deal of time on it uh, for four years. Uh, I have concentrated on certain, uh, in certain areas, primarily the photographic mm -hmm. evidence. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not a photographer, but uh, I saw something in the way uh, Governor Connolly slumped in one of the frames of the Zapruder film, which was presented in Life magazine a few days after the assassination. I believe is the issue of November 29th, 63. These were the black and white stills. They were still black and white only because... Uh, the issue had to go to press so shortly after the assassination, within two days, that life did not have time to color process them. I see. And uh, one or two of those frames made me believe that at least some of the shots could not have come from the book depository. Just by the way the governor slumped. By the way the governor slumped. I, I didn't draw a firm conclusion at that time. Uh, I was inclined to uh, believe that uh, the way he slumped was inconsistent with a shot having originated from the book depository. From then on, I concentrated on the photographic evidence and uh, on some other aspects, for instance, uh, Bullet 399, as you've noted, but primarily the photographic evidence. And, uh, bullet 399, if I'm not mistaken, I hope I'm not, or else I'll sound very silly, was the bullet that was found on the stretcher, was it not? It was found, when you say the stretcher, we indicate a specific stretcher. It was found on a specific stretcher, but there was considerable questions to which stretcher. It was originally reported it was found on Kennedy stretcher. Uh, the commission said this was not true, and here is one instance where I agree with the commission. My own investigation of the circumstances surrounding its discovery convinces me it could not have been found on Kennedy stretcher. Uh, it was found on either Governor Connolly's stretcher, which is most likely, or possibly on a stretcher very close to Governor Connolly's, which was uh, connected with another patient unrelated to the assassination. What was so unusual about Commission Exhibit 399? Everything about it is extremely unusual, from its appearance uh, to its discovery. Uh, the bullet had no trace of blood or tissue on it. The FBI could detect no trace whatsoever of blood or tissue on that bullet. There's no evidence that it ever had any blood or tissue on it. The bullet, according to the Warren Commission, uh, went through two men, both uh, the President and Governor Connolly, uh, smashing Governor Connolly's rib and wrist as it went. And uh, yet the bullet is relatively undistorted. The nose is totally undistorted and it is slightly flattened. And uh, for all of these, for several reasons, and for additional reasons that uh, I don't think for the purpose of this program you'd want to go into, it's quite clear that this bullet could not have accomplished the damage that the Commission said it did, number one, and also my own investigation of it convinces me that it was not fired in anger at anyone and that its sole role was to be planted in order to implicate Lee Harvey Oswald. Planted by whom? by one of the conspirators. I have no idea as to the identity of the individual who actually did the planting, but uh, my approach in my book was to examine as objectively as I could and as thoroughly as I could every conceivable way that this bullet could have been legitimately involved in the assassination, if I could use the word legitimately in connection with the assassination, uh, actually a bullet that was fired. My analysis convinces me that there is no way that this can have occurred. I believe this bullet was deliberately fired in such a manner into uh, a gun cotton mm -hmm. so as to uh, prevent its substantial distortion. The reason why the bullet could not be substantially distorted would be if it was uh, so distorted, it would be impossible to make a 
positive identification with the rifle allegedly belonging to Oswald. The critics, to my knowledge, have not been harassed. Mark Lane met some harassment when he tried to get back into the country uh, in his travels. He would, his name would be in a lookout book. But generally, the critics have not been harassed. I would say a couple things about that. First of all, we are not yet a total police state. Secondly, the critics, the critics, by and large, have been able to glean their information from published sources from the Warren Commission mm -hmm. volumes. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Mark Lane and some others also did personal investigation in Dallas. That is true. But by and large, the critics have brought information to light, which was really available for any citizen if he wanted to take the time to dig it out. Now you referred to the deaths, and my own feeling, by the way, uh, without knowing if any single one of the, I think there's 30 now, approximately 30 that Penn Jones writes of, of these deaths without knowing if any one of these are actually directly connected, I believe some of them have to be because statistically the number is so incredibly large that for it to be mere happenstance is almost unbelievable. However, in answer to your question, the pattern there was these were people who were in a position to know something or have seen something or have heard something that was not available to others. It is a fact that Almost in every one of these cases, somebody was connected in one way or another with Ruby, and I don't mean as innocently as perhaps being his milkman uh, or something like that. There was some connection. They were in a position to know something. Um, for instance, two men who saw uh, the killer of Tippett, if it was one killer, run from the scene of the crime. They didn't see the shooting, but mm -hmm. they saw him run, uh, who had difficulty identifying him as Oswald, both were assaulted. One was shot in the head and he lived, and the other one was killed. Hmm. Uh, one's name is uh, Harold Russell. He died uh, several months ago as a result of uh, being attacked by a police officer in Oklahoma City. And the other one, Warren Reynolds, was shot in the head. Two days. I, I just note the fact. I don't know if there's any uh, significance to it. Two days after he spoke to the FBI. He spoke to the FBI three months after the assassination. The FBI interviewed him. Two days later, he was shot in the head. And I am not implying that the FBI shot him in the head. I'm implying, what I am implying, if anything here, is that somebody was aware that he was talking to authorities. And uh, since the description, uh, he was unable to identify the man that he saw run as Oswald. But after he was shot in the head and recovered, he then went to the Warren Commission and said, now I'm sure it's Oswald. Do you believe Oswald fired any weapon that day? I'm inclined to believe he did not. Uh, by that I mean that the evidence that I have seen so far is insufficient for me to believe that Oswald killed anybody that day. However, if uh, new evidence is brought to light, evidence that the Warren Commission did not present, proving Oswald's involvement or uh, either as an actual shooter or as a conspirator, I'm certainly not committed against accepting that idea. But I'd have to do it on proof, and so far the proof does not allow one to reach that conclusion. There are some, of course, who believe that Oswald was involved in the, cons in, con in the conspiracy in the specific capacity of being a patsy and a dodge. There are others who believe he had absolutely nothing to do with the conspiracy, had nothing, no prior knowledge of the assassination of the president. Which camp, if either, do you subscribe to? I uh, strongly believe that Oswald was a patsy. Now, that allows for one of two possibilities. Either he was totally innocent of any prior knowledge of the assassination and was picked as the patsy, or else he was involved in the plot and, unbeknownst to him, was picked by the others to be the fall guy. Now, I'm inclined towards the first view, that he was totally innocent of any now knowing participation in the crime. Uh, that he was just set up. That he it. was just set up. However, as I stated before, if, if later evidence proves that he was involved, I'm prepared to accept it. What about Ruby's role? That is not the uh, one area that I've made a special study of. So I, what I can tell you is my impressions from what I have studied. Ruby's killing of Oswald, I am convinced, was part of the plot. As to, whether, as to the question of whether or not Ruby knew what he actually was engaged in, that's, that's another question. I'm open on that. As of the present moment, I don't know of any evidence, and I haven't personally have not seen any evidence which convinces me that Ruby had prior knowledge of the assassination. As of now, I've seen enough to convince me that he was used to murder Oswald. Ray, we're just about out of time here. Uh, do you think we're ever going to know 
before uh, 75 years from now when they open ar the archives. Yes, I do. I do. And the reason uh, I think that's so, and I thought that all along, is that while there is such a thing as frame-ups, which are completely tight, where everything falls into place, that could remain secret for extended and indefinite periods of time, the plain truth about this case is that it's so palpably false that the official version falls apart, falls apart, and even a cursory examination. What's, once that is done, of course, uh, and it, that already has been done to the satisfaction of most of the public of the poll show, we have a surprising statistic. I read a poll which said two-thirds of the public don't believe the Warren report. Mm -hmm. By implication, that means they believe there was more than one assassin involved. However, two-thirds of the public don't want a new investigation. And that also is a rather sad commentary. Mm -hmm. I think it's fear, frankly. I think there's a, a conscious or unconscious fear that if we dig too deeply in this, we might find something so terrible that it'll absolutely shake our what sense of security uh, we have left in society. Could you hint at what that terrible reality might be? Well, I, I could only tell you my opinion here, and I cannot prove it. Uh, the work that I've done uh, is not in the direction of being able to prove how high up or what forces did it. But the evidence that uh, is available to me leads me to believe, leads me to believe that this was a plot of quite high level, quite high level. I can't name names because I don't know and it would be, uh, you know, just guessing to start uh, kicking names around here. But that it went high. I think this. Uh, President Johnson instituted a cover-up shortly after the assassination. He I think, instituted the cover-up? Well, maybe that's a little too broad. He was the responsible officer. He, was the respo he is in charge of our government, and a cover-up was instituted under President Johnson. So I, as a citizen, feel I have a right to hold President Johnson responsible for that, especially since the fact that it has now been brought to public view that the Warren report is palpably false. So since he's the responsible officer, uh, I feel I have a right to state that the cover-up is the responsibility of President Johnson's. Now, as long as that remains the case, people have a right to demand, have a right to demand that the president move on this and reopen the case. However, I say that uh, uh, just to make a statement because I don't believe it will happen. I don't believe there's any chance of it happening while, pres while President Johnson uh, remains in the White House. My guest has been Raymond Marcus, author of The Bastard Bullet, A Search for Legitimacy for Commission Exhibit 399. Thank you very much, Ray. They recall the meeting between then-Senator John F. Kennedy and famed writer Stephen Moran. Well, that was in 1960, uh, in the late spring, that I visited uh, Senator Kennedy in his office in Washington. And uh, we had a little lunch, and uh, I was joking with him, and I said to him, I wish you wouldn't uh, run for the nomination. And they said, why? I said, you know what happened, uh, what happened in the past, uh, ever since 1840, every president who was elected in 20 years intervals, died in the personal chair or was assassinated. So the next one, the uh, next president, who's supposed to die, uh, will be the one who is elected in 1960. And uh, he laughed and he said, well, I tell you what, you know, if I get the nomination, if I, then if I get elected, I will promise you uh, to break the jinx. And uh, we laughed about it, and that's uh, that was the whole thing.
as far as we can tell, uh, I must tell you that uh, Garrison has every confidence that he's going into court February 14th, which is a month away. Uh, I, um, and I expect he will. But the scenario points toward a, um, a coalition uh, of uh, anti-Castro Cuban exiles, oil-rich psychotics, I'm quoting a district attorney in Texas, retired militarists, various voices of the right, that is at an operational level of the conspiracy, and at a planning level, the Cubans were a good setup because uh, they were disenchanted with the uh, Kennedy administration. And also, they were lawless. You've got to remember that these informants who worked for the CIA along the way, if you have government by hoodlum, what are you spawning? Every cop we know in L.A. has his contacts on Main Street or East Fifth Street. He's got junkies and pimps and peddlers, etc. But he knows what they are, and he keeps them within perspective uh, to work for the greater good, as they say. The CIA keeps them on staff for 20 years and gives them a watch at the end of their service, and that's the difference. This undercover thing of doing what you want to, and countermanding orders of the president, and writing blank checks, and not being checked by the Congress, uh, spawns a government by hoodlum. That is not to say that the government... Uh, uh, subsidize the assassination. We don't know that, and Garrison denies it. I said, why do you say ex-CIA men? He says, because I can't conceive of anybody in my government wanting to harm the president. But the point is, somewhere along the line, we gave up. We, we gave in when the government said, we know better what's good for you than you know for yourself. That's why, you know, the liberalism of today you know, whether it's Lawrence Sherman in the 28th District saying, I'm going into the convention with a peace slate, or Robert Vaughn saying the war is the aberration of, of Lyndon Johnson and not Robert Kennedy, is puny, or Carl Reiner saying Dick Van Dyke and I are going to host a black tie party at the Daisy for Eugene McCarthy or dissenting Democrats. This is 20 years too late, man. They've been drafting people like you for 20 years. So that eventually, 435 honorable men in the Congress don't, e don't even object. And nobody votes against the Un-American Activities Committee. And nobody says anything about the war. And nobody says anything about anything. And nobody says anything about murder in the streets. I've been crying fascism, fascism. How, how much success, how heady was the sensation, and how intoxicated were the fascists in this country to get to a point where they thought they could go ahead with as bold a stroke as killing him in the street? Well, obviously, what makes them think they can get away with it? The experience of getting away with it over the years. They tend to get power drunk because they've been successful. It gets crazier and crazier. They've extended fascism without challenge for so long in this country, a generation, since 1945. The dark days, this long night started with Roosevelt's death. You can chart the whole thing, and it gets to a point where a whole generation doesn't know any better. Robert Kennedy talks about... Uh, uh, a, ma a massive retaliation and communism and capitalism and vehicular capability. You're brought up on those terms, man. You can't even tell when somebody is jiving you anymore because it's 20 years of madness. As much as my Jewish friends aren't going to like it, the German people weren't born crazy. They were made crazy by their government. They were made in a form which is most convenient to that government which is fascistic, which broke the backs of the unions and used anti-Semitism as a dodge. Same thing is happening here. They're trying to drive the American people crazy, and I'll tell you something, I think they're succeeding. There's great evidence in the barbarism of day-to-day -day life and in the lack of direction and in the, uh, the degree of uh, the lack of mental health in this country. Um, and I'm not suggesting going to a psychiatrist because most of them are sellouts too. Sad to say, because they know better, but all they want to do is repair you and get you back on the line to keep punching out Mustang frames uh, that's, the, that's the trouble. Look what you have here. FDR dies. What was the plan? To make Germany an occupied agricultural state. But what happens afterwards? Truman goes into office, and he forms the Defense Department, the Marshall Plan. He aids the fascists in the hills of Greece to stop communism. He, expand, he founds the CIA in 1947. 
He gives J. Edgar Hoover a blank check, and they go ahead with the Un-American Activities Committee, and they start the great witch hunts. And McCarthy comes on. And two bombs on the Japanese people, civilian areas, high, uh, atomic bombs. And the Korean War, the bold stroke, anti-communism. We will not tolerate it uh, anywhere. The Truman Doctrine, outside the Western Hemisphere. And uh, Russia, and Korea, and uh, China, and Vietnam, and Santa Domingo. You can see it step for step. 22 years of fascism that your country becomes a colonial power. Now, of course, we're not made for that because that's not our tradition. So that's the conflict. That's why everybody is hung up and they say, well, why do the kids look so weird? Because you're driving their body in one direction, their head is going in another. They're being pulled apart. It's the same as taking a young man in this country and tying a stallion to one leg and one arm each side and pulling in, in opposing directions. We're not made for it. We weren't measured for an SS suit. Man, if I was going to form a fascist state, I would go to the Germans. They're set up for it. You know, it's like Sinatra told me. You're going to buy, buy a record company. Don't found one. He bought one that was set up already. You have to be efficient. He had a commitment, too, by the way. Sinatra. Yeah, the house I live in. I don't hear that from him anymore. I don't hear from anybody anymore. Where are all of you? Or don't you care? Because I don't know where you're going to live. You know, you can only go to make a movie in England for three months. That's almost closed. Where are you going to go? You can't hide in Switzerland. You know, you are an American. You're not going to feel that good. Everybody says, well, if you've got enough money, you'll feel good anywhere. It's really not true. There isn't anything quite like America, uh, especially if you're an American. You're really going to miss it. I know you take it for granted, but uh, you're uh, going to miss it. You're going to miss, uh, you know, the sun coming up in the morning. You don't think so until you're in the Holocaust, and, of course, it's too late. But to get back uh, to your question, to stop theorizing for a while, um, this, uh, this group uh, of ex neo-Nazis who would uh, uh, have brought us fascism in the name of national security. The facts on who shot the president are in the archives because of national security. Everything is national security. The CIA is national security. The FBI is national security. And uh, meanwhile, you don't recognize your own country. Look what we have. Think of America as a body. You have, uh, and think of the pressure points in the first aid class. Mark Lane is saying to you, I've got his uh, pulse in the left arm, and he has an accelerated pulse, and Jim Garrison's got the right arm, and he says it, and Mario Savio is uh, up there by his right temple, and he says it, and Stokely Carmichael is down by his left ankle, and he says it. And Adam Powell says it in his own way. The patient has a high fever and an accelerated pulse. And I can't find anybody who cares about this guy. They talk about heart transplants and what happened to Mike Kasparik. They don't care what happened to America. That's what it's all about. You don't have to love your parents. I'm not demanding that. Miss Liberty, what about it? What about the pursuit of the American dream? An awful lot of good men died so that a good many of you can sit out there and think about whether you want to sell out or not. I'm worried that it's too late for you to sell in. That's what really terrifies me. I don't know whether we're over the hill or not. Naturally, I'm going to get up tomorrow and go after it the same way. The bell rings, you come out of your corner swinging, because we've got to keep trying, because this is all we have. But it is evident, you know, nobody has to be naive about the elements in this country. Why did I indict liberals earlier, the so-called social democrats of my routines, when I say the far right? Because there aren't enough evil men in this country. Their army... They are the generals, but the privates in their army, the vast ranks of the unwashed, are the liberals. It is, in other words, evil men can only do evil because of the indifference of good men, to paraphrase a philosopher. And that's what it is. The road to fascism was paved with those liberal bricks. Every young man who was headed for the left was castrated by a good liberal who wants him to fit in. And when you cock a gun and put it at the temple of a liberal, he signs the petition on the right, not on the left. There is no left in America. There is no dissension. A few university professors. How many people came up to you and said, uh, it's a terrible thing what happened to Dr. Spock? They just, they, they're just glad it didn't happen to them, right? The only reason they're talking about Vietnam is because we're talking about Kennedy. And if you and I let go of Kennedy and talk about Vietnam, they'll go to the Negroes. And if you and I go to the Negroes, that'll free them for the weekend so they can go to Palm Springs. I know where they're at. They have sold us out. That's really what they've done. They've sold out a generation. 
Every time you meet a guy 40, you have a right to spit in his face because he's cast a shadow over your future.